Welcome to For the Record. Today we're going to have a special presentation honoring Mrs. H. H. A. Beach. In a moment you're going to find out why I'm referring to her so carefully in those terms. Mrs. Beach is the mother of American women composers. And today I have with me two women from the National League of American Pen Women. I have Leslie Holmes with me and I have Minuetta Kessler. Both of these women have been very much involved in the musical world. And though we like to think that we've progressed quite a bit from the days when women had to work a little more in order to become recognized, we're going to learn today that the battle isn't quite over yet. As a little bit of background, the National League of American Pen Women was formed in Washington, D.C. Among the founders was Marion Longfellow, the niece of Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. She and two other journalists, who were correspondents in Washington for newspapers, found that they were denied entry to the press gallery in Congress because women simply weren't allowed. Minuetta, let me start with you, because as one of the American women composers, I've heard from you that you sometimes have some of the problems that we usually think of as happening long ago. Yes, well, long ago, mm -hmm. I had a dream that I would like to be a composer. But in those days, I only knew uh, Bach, Mozart, Beethoven, and they were all men. Uh, suddenly, at a later stage, as, when I was still a child, I noticed a piece published in the, in the Etude magazine with the name Mrs. H. H. A. Beach. And that made me realize that there was at least one woman composer who made it, who was actually published. So it gave me courage to become a composer. So she was an inspiration to you. She was a role model for me, yes. But the road was very, very rocky. I had many, many setbacks. And the worst one of all was the first publisher that I contacted in New York, Mills Publishing, who wrote me a letter that they consider that I'm a very talented composer, but they would not publish my music, but they hoped that I would continue to compose as much as my household tasks would allow. That was a real put down. I wonder if they dare say that anymore. Well, I have a letter to show that, they, that did. Right? Uh -huh. they did. But of course, I don't know how it is right now, because lately I have been accepted by uh, publishers. Not my best music, though, just my teaching material. My, my big music is not published except by my own publishing company. So there's still a certain discrimination Tremendous, going on yes. over there. Yes. Well, Amy Beach being your inspiration, Leslie, maybe you might tell us a little bit about how Amy Beach was able to do some of this back in, uh, was it 1867 or so? That uh, Yes, she was born in a little mm -hmm. town in New Hampshire, Henniker, mm -hmm. New Hampshire, in 1867. And her father was a paper manufacturer and an importer, and her mother was very, very influential on the little girl. Her mother was a, uh, a singer and a pianist. Now, granted, she was an amateur, but apparently she was quite talented. And little Amy was an extraordinary prodigy. Mm -hmm. By the time she was one year old, she could sing 40 tunes, always in the same key. And oh, that is extraordinary. Isn't it? Yeah. And by the time she was two, she could harmonize an alto line to her mother's soprano line. And by the time she was three, she taught herself to read. And at the age of four, she would compose pieces in her head and then play them on the piano. And she could also play four-part hymns using all four parts. And it was at that time, when she was four years old, that she moved to Chelsea. And this, I think, brings us back to you, Minuetta. Oh, yes. <laughs> Let's tie this in as to Amy's moving yes. to Chelsea. Well, my husband lived in Chelsea. Mm -hmm. And one day he was visiting his brother there. We now live in Belmont. And he came across a plaque of Mrs. Beach as one of the great residents of Chelsea. But the plaque was all covered with graffiti, mustache and all. And it was also a cheap plaque. So he came home and he said, maybe one of your women's organizations would like to do something about this. And I immediately thought of the pen women, 
And I called up the mayor and told him that I was very disturbed that this plaque was uh, so damaged and also that it was too cheap for her talents and that uh, I would like to start a fund for a sculpture of Mrs. Beach to be placed in a safe place like at the entrance of a library. And the mayor was very interested, Mayor Brennan, and he said, I will put you in touch with a librarian. The librarian was extremely excited, and Mr. Menadakis um, gave us a letter of recommendation to the Arts Council, and we, uh, finally we did get an Arts Lottery grant for a concert. Well, they didn't have the money to, to give us for the whole sculpture, but uh, for the concert, mm -hmm. and we decided to use the concert as a kickoff for the sculpture fund. I see. So this is uh, going to start a fund for the eventual sculpture That's right. of Amy Beach. Yes. Maybe you might like to tell people where they could send some well, of this to money to the Public for Library of Chelsea. Uh -huh, that would be the easiest uh, That's right. thing to yes. do. Just simply send a donation for the Amy Beach Memorial Fund That's correct. to the Public Library in Chelsea, yes. Massachusetts, of course. That's right. Now this brings us to the program or the concert that you're planning to have. Have you outlined you know, the music that you're going to have in there, are they all Amy Beach compositions? All the songs that mm -hmm. I'm singing are by Mrs. Beach. Mm -hmm. There will be two groups of uh, about 20 minutes each, and then Virginia Eskin, who is playing the songs for me and who is a marvelous pianist and for many years has been a champion of women composers will play a group of solo piano works by Mrs. Beach, and then she will end the program with a group of rags oh, by right. two okay. women composers. Now, explain to me what you mean by rags. That's a particular beat, isn't it, in well, music? Well, it's like mm -hmm. Scott Joplin, sure. Mm -hmm. Everybody is familiar with that. Da -da, da -da, da -da, da. It's, that's <laughs> jazzy. Yes. yes. Mm -hmm. So her works were varied then from what you're telling me. Uh, the, this will not be Mrs. Beach's works. The, the rags mm -hmm. were are by two other women composers. I see, I see. So we're, we are also going to be featuring other women composers. Just two others, uh, yes. In here too. Can you tell me a little bit about Mrs. Beach's life in Chelsea? Why do you keep correcting me when I call her Amy? <laughs> <laughs> well that took place after Chelsea, but I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about mm -hmm. Chelsea first. She moved there, as I said, when she was four years old, and she was uh, very attached to the church her family was, the Central Congregational Church. And at the age of six, she begged her mother for piano lessons, and so her mother said she would teach her three times a week, and she taught her Chopin, Handel, Beethoven. Mm -hmm. And at the age of seven, she gave two solo recitals at the church, and uh, this was her public debut. And she played uh, Handel, Beethoven, Chopin, and Beach. <laughs> At the age of eight, uh, her family moved to Boston. And then she went to a private school and started studying with uh, professional teachers. And on it went. The reason she insisted on being called Mrs. H.H.A. Beach is because at the age of 18, she married a very prominent Boston surgeon, Dr. Henry Harris Aubrey Beach, who was not only prominent, but he was 24 years older than she was. And so uh, she just felt so privileged to be his wife. She was almost a child wife for him. And he did not want her then to play in public for money. And he also did not want her to study anymore. And so she was basically self-taught as a composer. From that time on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Yeah. She only had one year of mm -hmm. study with a teacher of composition. And then she was very mm -hmm. fluent in several languages. And so she translated the treatises on uh, composition by Berlioz and Javert, two French composers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then she would write down from memory Bach fugues and analyze their composition. And that was how she learned to compose. She yeah. was really a genius. I, I guess I have to give my feeling here. Here is a woman who is so accomplished in her own right and yet she still felt that she should take her identity from her husband, also accomplished, but in a certainly different 
field, yes. uh, totally. One thing that was very interesting to me, or that is very interesting to me, is that she was married to him for 25 years, and he died in 1810. They were married in 18, 1910. He died that year, and they had been married in 1885. So, little Mrs. Beach, people who knew her called her little Mrs. Five by Five. Apparently, she was very small and very uh, ample. <laughs> Uh, she took herself off to Europe after spending 25 years composing. It was actually very fortuitous that she had those 25 years of being well taken care of. They lived in Marlborough Street. They had plenty of money. Um, she was not allowed to play in public except a few benefit concerts a year. And so she had all this time with no concerns in which to compose. A few months after he died, though, she took off to Europe and established herself as a composer and as a, as a pianist. And so for the next, she died in 1944, so for the next, we'll say, 25 years, um, she became very famous. There were beach music clubs all over the country. My grandmother, who was about 10 years older than she was and was a singer, used to sing her songs a great deal. And um, I'm sure heard her music, which was commissioned for the Women's Pavilion at the uh, World's Fair in Chicago in 1893. And my grandmother was there because in her spoon collection there is a uh, spoon from that fair. So she was, even though she wanted to be called Mrs. Beach, and I know people who knew her and said that she would be very upset to be called Amy Beach, that she just didn't like that. She still was very, very independent and um, very aware of her contribution. So probably it was just the social mores of the day that might have made a difference. Um, yes, in, in I think this. so. Now, as a woman composer yourself, has there ever been any emphasis on Amy Beach's works? You know, what has now brought them to the surface again? Uh, the, the, the crime of it is that they were buried after mm -hmm. she died, they went out of print. You couldn't even buy them. But I was so excited the other day mm -hmm. when I found a an, an notice of a concert uh, presenting her grand mass in E-flat in Rhode mm -hmm. Island. And I immediately decided to go and hear it. And I was thrilled, absolutely thrilled with that music. She was a really great genius. And she wrote that mass when she was 18 years old. Yeah, that's extraordinary. Unbelievable. Yeah. It was written yeah. for full orchestra, organ, harp, and four soloists. Now, did you say this was her 100th anniversary that, of, of the, that this was commemorating? Of, of the composition of, of this composition. mass. Yes. It wasn't performed immediately, but a couple of uh -huh. years later. Uh, it was performed by the Handel and Haydn uh, uh, I see. chorus mm -hmm. of Boston. And it, it received rave reviews. But it was not performed again until about 80 years later, 82 years later, at New York University performed it, and this was the third performance. Now that's a criminal thing. I don't know how that could have happened, except that she was a woman. No, no, no. I don't agree with you totally. Excuse me. <laughs> I, I think uh, that, that the, the Boston School of Composers including Horatio Parker and uh, Chadwick Foote, felt that the highest compliment they could pay her was that she was one of the boys. So I don't think that, which as we realize now is quite a chauvinistic comment, but it, it wasn't meant that way. It was just a different era. And they all fell into uh, anonymity, we might say. And I think it was because during World War II, people did not really concern themselves that much with the arts because they were too busy trying to survive. Mm -hmm. sure. And after World War II, there was a, um, an upsurgence of interest in European composers. And so it has only been in the last 10, 15 years that any of these composers, I've been looking at, at recordings at WCRB, uh, which is where I work, mm -hmm. And most of the recordings of uh, the male composers, too, 
date from the last 10 to 15 years. Mm -hmm. So I think there has been certainly a much greater interest in women composers, but I think that Mrs. Beach fell by the wayside, as did all of her contemporaries. She was a formidable pianist, and at 16 made her debut in Boston, a very successful debut. And then at the age of 17, she made her debut with the Boston Symphony, playing Chopin's F minor concerto. And then she made several other appearances, and uh, then she premiered her own piano concerto with the Boston Symphony in 1900. So um, she was, this was very exciting. And after her husband died, she played it several more times with the Boston Symphony and with other symphonies in Europe and this country. So she had one recognition during her lifetime. Oh, a great this deal was, of recognition. Mm -hmm. But that mass was neglected. You can't deny that. <laughs> the mass was buried. Yes. And but, it was a gorgeous piece of music. <laughs> it should have been performed mm -hmm. hundreds of times. Are there any recordings of her work by any chance? Of Did her she... piano playing, not that I have uh -huh. found. There is a, re a recording of her piano concerto, and uh, several months ago I heard Virginia Eskin, who will be playing in the concert on Sunday, play her piano concerto with the Boston Civic Symphony. It was fabulous. Virginia is a, is a wonderful pianist. Tell me a little bit about the programs that you do give. I understand that you do give some of these concerts to the schools. Well, I, I have done a great deal of in-school performing. I did a lot for the Opera Company of Boston. Mm -hmm. And earlier this week, uh, Minuetta and I went into one of the schools in Chelsea, and Minuetta spoke a little bit about uh, being a composer. And then I was a three-ring circus. I talked about Mrs. Beach, and I played for myself and sang her music. And it was to about 150 12 to 15-year-olds, and they were wonderful. They loved it, and they were quiet and attentive and appreciative. And taking music into the schools this way, I think, is just such a wonderful thing. I love doing it. Well, now, how could somebody arrange for your concert to be in one of their schools. Let's say I'm listening to you and <laughs> I want you to inspire some of my 12 to 15 year olds. What would I do? I think the best thing is probably mm -hmm. to give me a call and I can see about arranging it. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if they can reach you, mm -hmm. they could do this. And it wouldn't necessarily be just schools. I would imagine groups would be involved in something like this too. Right. Yes. If, uh, yes. It's a wonderful thing mm -hmm. for women's clubs, but I, I hate to limit it to that because you're just kind of bringing mm -hmm. the mountain to Mohammed mm -hmm. instead of uh, uh, really of, going to people mm -hmm. who perhaps yeah. would not have any vested interest in mm -hmm. um, putting forth a woman composer. Mm -hmm. Well, the children need to, he to hear this music. The children need to know that there was a great woman composer, oh, definitely. and that there was there's a great woman <laughs> singer. And really, I was amazed at how uh, it came, how beautifully it came through, mm -hmm. uh, with Leslie playing the piano and singing at the same time and speaking. <laughs> she she just wowed them. They were they were so quiet. They were just tremendously attentive and interested. Now, do you give a commentary and... Uh... Well, I just made an introduction mm -hmm. to it, but that is not necessary. <laughs> <laughs> well, what is good, though, is that you yourself, being a composer, mm -hmm. uh, do you tell the children a little bit about how you might have gotten started? I could do that, yes. Mm -hmm. And maybe you could tell us how you got started. <laughs> Well, uh, if you have time, yes. yes. For sure. Uh -huh. It was my mother's dream, really, that I was going to be a pianist. She didn't mm -hmm. think of me as a composer. She didn't plan on that. I surprised her. Uh -huh. But I did have to uh, go by her dream because she named me Minuetta. So yeah. how could I be anything else? Uh, but it just happened that I love music very, very deeply. Mm -hmm. And as soon as the piano was wheeled into the house, I went, went to the piano, sat down, and played a piece, a complete piece. And this piece is exactly the same now as it was when I first played it. I'm publishing it now. In fact, I'm publishing quite a number of my childhood pieces. And I was only four at that time. Uh, and my mother took me to a teacher, John M. Williams, who is a very well-known music educator 
and he said that I, he, he never had any experience in teaching a four-year-old, and he would have to study child psychology before he undertook to teach me. So he said, I'm going to New York this summer, and I will take a course at Columbia University, and in the fall, I'll teach her. So that's exactly what he did. And when I was five, he gave me my first lesson, and three months later, he put me on the stage, and I gave a debut. And I also played my own compositions, and I played Mozart, Schumann, and Bach. And I was launched at that time because I have a review of that concert. Uh, so it almost sounds like, even if you didn't have the parental influence, it looks like you might have very easily gone through the, uh, the career path uh, of music. I'm just yes. grateful she didn't name you rock and roller. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that would have been because I heard your music, and of course I, uh, I enjoy it very thoroughly. Well, thank you very so, much. What's the timing of this concert now that's coming up uh, on Saturday? Oh, it's, it's on the uh, 13th, okay. <laughs> Saturday, at 3:30 mm -hmm. in the afternoon, and it, it's at the YMCA in Chelsea. Mm -hmm. And this is a uh, performance a, that's free to the public. It's as free I to the public, it. and there will even be mm -hmm. refreshments. And it's, uh, <laughs> uh, is it sponsored by the uh, Massachusetts Arts Lottery? Not Massachusetts. Not well, uh, it's the Chelsea, as administered by the Chelsea mm -hmm. Arts Lottery, uh, the Chelsea Arts Council. And you did mention that the mayor has given you his uh, support. Yes, and he will mm -hmm. be speaking. Mm -hmm. He will address us at that concert. And we'll have some other interesting mm -hmm. people there. I hope to have a senator, is it Senator Vogt? Mm -hmm. uh, from that district? Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good. Well, Mrs. Beach was one of the pen women uh, of the organization that I spoke about earlier. And uh, the pen women have numbered among their members two presidents' wives, Florence Harding and Eleanor Roosevelt. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt, I guess, was very well known to many of us. She was a columnist, she was a world traveler, and of course, being the wife of the uh, president during World War II, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, she became very well known and has been one of the supporting members, of course, during her lifetime for the Pen Women. Now, we also have our own illustrious member right here in Sudbury, Helene Sherman. And Helene is very well known to many of our folks here. She is a calligraphist, she is an artist, and uh, she is without peer. One of the other things that I noted when I first became a pen woman myself was that many of the members were 90 plus years old and still operating, composing, uh, draw, uh, painting, writing. So at that time I remember thinking this is probably better than taking out a life insurance policy. <laughs> if they live to be 90 plus years old, yes. there's got to be something that they're doing right. I appreciate the fact that you, as one of the few women composers, have come with us here today. And Leslie, tell me a little bit about your uh, radio background, because I know you mentioned that earlier. I'm in my 10th year at WCRB, mm -hmm. uh, hosting a program. For the first six years, it was called mm -hmm. Leslie Holmes Sings. Mm -hmm. And it was on every Saturday morning for a half an hour. And after six years of doing a new program every week, I had sung everything I should sing, probably some things I shouldn't have sung, and I really wanted to change the focus so that I could have time to learn pieces in more depth. And I was doing a lot of live performing, and I always felt as if I was going and not sure I knew the music. So from that time on, in 86, uh, the radio program became called The Vocal Point. And I address all vocal issues. I have uh, interviewed some very distinguished international singers, Ellie Ameling, Kiri Takanawa, mm -hmm. uh, Shirley Verrett, etc. And I've also done programs on composers, Ned Roram being one of them. And then sometimes I just take a kind of music, maybe all the settings of the, po the poet Paul Verlaine, mm -hmm. set by different composers. And I play recordings, I talk about the poet and the composers, I do some of the singing myself. And That's, I also, yes. What you did for the pen women is a wonderful thing. Leslie has uh, offered to sing music by, uh, by the composers of the pen women. 
and she has done a tremendous job because she has inspired us, she got us to write new music, and she performed them magnificently. So we are very, very grateful to Leslie for her devotion to the pen women. And oh, we made pleasure. her a pen woman too. <laughs> <laughs> it's my absolute pleasure. It's, it's, it's such fun to work with a composer, especially when the piece perhaps has been composed for you or has not been mm -hmm. performed before, because something comes off the page which mm -hmm. is more than any of us knew when we were by ourselves looking at it or, or composing it, was there. Mm -hmm. And it is, it is very exciting, and it's a privilege to do it. Oh, this is true now. I remember you had one program up at St. Mark's School, mm -hmm. for instance, and that combined the work of the writers or poets yes. in the pen women with the composers such as yourself. That's right. And as I recall, weren't there about ten different uh, pieces that were put together this way? Well, Leslie yeah. has a whole program. It's called uh -huh. Woman's Song. Mm -hmm. We mm -hmm. have now established it as an international organization called Woman's Song. And she has many more than 10, maybe <laughs> more like 30 <laughs> pieces. And she varies them, of course. And uh, she's performed them many times with the help of Arts Lottery Grants. Mm -hmm. And we made a CD. It's not quite out yet, but it's all made. The master is mm -hmm. completed. So this will be available. Yes. Yes. Soon. yes. And we're uh -huh. planning, hopefully, a European trip next mm -hmm. year. Because some of the composers from Europe have been here and have heard this woman's song, and they've said, gosh, we'd like to be in on it. So mm -hmm. we used to be Woman's Song of Massachusetts, and we have expanded to be Woman's Song International. Well, that's very exciting all by it itself. It is exciting. Yeah, that you it have. It is exciting. And it all started with the pen women. So you see, mm -hmm. this organization is an important organization to belong to. And I hope mm -hmm. that some other people out there... In the creative uh, arts? Uh -huh. Yes, will, will take note and mm -hmm. contact you. One thing yes. I think it's important to leave everybody with is the fact that Mrs. Beach's songs alone were sung by the great singers of the time, the international singers, not just American singers. And her symphony was played all over Europe, as well as this country. After she'd been to Europe, one, cr one critic in Berlin said, this is the foremost American composer. He did not say foremost American woman Woman composer, composer. yeah. And I think that this is very important to bear in mind. One of her songs, called Ecstasy, earned enough money to enable her to buy a house on the Cape, which she then called Ecstasy, and where she went in the summers after her husband had died and she moved to New York to compose. And she composed the words, too. She composed that the words to the song mm -hmm. Ecstasy, yes. Mm -hmm. I, I find this inspiring all by itself. Yes. Everybody yes. can write a song that yes. buys them yes. a home. Uh, but this is interesting to me that she even got the recognition in the uh, European field because... Yes. Uh, Americans were not so Yes, yeah. The Americans were not looked upon as being uh, cultural leaders to begin with. And, of course, uh, even European men did not give right. women the freedom that we enjoyed over here. That's right. Uh, also, mm -hmm. so it's... One gentleman who has recently passed away, David Blair McCluskey, knew her and sang with her playing for him. And he said that she was just the nicest person you would ever want to know, but that no one ever said no to the <laughs> speech. So she seemed to be this wonderful uh -huh. combination of... Uh -huh being nice, but yet having, having enough sense of self and enough sense mm -hmm. of purpose so that people did what she felt that they should do. That makes me sorry she's not still around. Yes, <laughs> yes, yes, I would have liked to Certainly know. like to take some lessons from her on the <laughs> art of uh, never having somebody say no to you and yet maintaining your uh, balance And he at the said same that time. she was mm -hmm. an amazing pianist. Mm -hmm. She had very little hands mm -hmm. and she just, she had a great deal of power when she played the piano. And I know this is something you've worked on, isn't it, Menuetta? Well, yes, people have commented in the newspaper that I play like a man. Oh, dear. 
<laughs> I don't know how to take that. But I see, I, is that a uh, compliment or not? But I do believe in uh, creating a big, rich, firm tone. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. I developed a technique for that purpose, and I teach that to all my students, even the four-year-olds. Well, you must really be right in tune with the four-year-olds, having started uh, that early yourself, exactly. so that you can handle... Yes. Handle them in all age levels. You're so right. Mm -hmm. You see, I, I composed when I was four years old, mm -hmm. so I know the mechanism of a four-year-old composing. And mm -hmm. therefore, I can bring this talent out of this child. Mm -hmm. And by the way, they all do it. All mm -hmm. my students compose it when, when they're four years old. That's just taken for granted. They compose mm -hmm. their first song when they take their first lesson. Now, is this because you teach them to do that? Yes, is, that's uh, right. Because I knew how, how to do it as a four-year-old. Mm -hmm. You see, if, if you haven't been through it at that age, you may not realize how a four-year-old thinks in and musical terms. And what you can term. expect of them. That's right. See, it might not occur to somebody like me to expect a four-year-old to compose. Exactly. But exactly. you would say, if I can do it, you can do it. Right, uh, right. You have like a, the whole thing in your mind. One interesting mm -hmm. little vignette is that when little Amy was... Uh, at home listening to her parents talk about some other child who could play anything that was asked of them. And so when, when they were finished talking, she piped up and she said, well, what's so hard about that? And her father said, oh, well, now that's very presumptuous of you. What do you mean? And I, there's a little poem here, which I think I have, it said, So Amy calmly waited until they were quite through, then said to their amazement, There's nothing much to do. Her father, quite indignant, said, Well, and may I ask why you should air such notions? I'll just set you the task of proving now how easy this test of tone may be. Just play some notes, please, mother. Twill not take long to see. So Amy faced her father, and as her mother played, she called each note correctly, nor ever once delayed. All kinds of combinations with double chords she tried until her wondering parents were fully satisfied. Then said her father, laughing, Well, Amy, dear, I see. To you, it's really nothing. You've my apology. Well, thank <laughs> you, Leslie. I don't know. Really? Isn't that well. interesting? <laughs> We have heard now, of course, from Leslie Holmes, Minuetta Counselor, of the honor that we're going to give Amy Beach as the mother of American Women Composers. This concert that they're planning to give, we hope, is going to be the first of annual concerts. Thank you both for being with us today. You're very My welcome. Pleasure. Thank you. Love.